Hi, I'm Professor Ben Trumbull, uh, Arizona State University, from the School of Human Evolution and Social Change and the Center for Evolution and Medicine. And today, I'm going to talk to you about evolutionary medicine and cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer worldwide. In the U.S., about one in every three deaths is due to cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease occurs when we get the buildup of cholesterol and fatty particles in uh, our, our arterial walls. This ends up blocking blood flow. That means that we don't get oxygen to our brain. We call that a stroke. Or we don't get oxygen to our heart. We call that a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Now, chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, um, they're on the rise worldwide. And we know for sure that things like diet and physical activity are associated with cardiovascular disease. If you have a really fatty diet, you're more likely to have a heart attack. But one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that it's in, only in recent years that uh, humans have started to become really sedentary. In terms of human history, cities are a really novel environment. You or I, we can go and uh, hunt and gather uh, 2,000 calories uh, at a fast food restaurant. We wouldn't have to get out of our car. We can drive to a grocery store and pick up as much food as we could ever eat. But that isn't the case for the most of the human past. For 99% of human history, we were hunter-gatherers. That meant that uh, if we wanted meat for dinner, we had to go hunting. Uh, I work with a population called the Chimane, a group of forager horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon living a traditional life way, similar to that of our ancestors. And if the average Chimane goes on a hunt, it lasts a little over eight hours and covers 17 kilometers. There's only a 60% chance that they come home with an animal. That's a very different lifestyle than the one that we live today. If you were to take all of the past five million years of human evolution uh, and compress them into a single year, we would be hunter-gatherers until December 31st at 6 a.m. Wouldn't be uh, until 3 p.m., that cities began to grow. And it wouldn't be until about 20 minutes to midnight uh, before the Industrial Revolution began and mega cities started to become developed. So this means that almost all of the human past was in a very different environment than the one that we live in today. In fact, the world that we, most people live in today is actually very weird. And that's where most of our medical research is conducted. It's conducted in these Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic nations. But that doesn't encompass the wide variety of variation in which humans still live today and the vast majority of human history. So what about something like cardiovascular disease? Uh, was that a disease that really impacted humans much in the past? Has cardiovascular disease always been the number one killer of people? Or is it just common now because of something that we're doing, maybe this sedentary lifestyle and this uh, industrialized uh, city-dwelling life that we live today? But wait a second. Before we go any further, didn't people used to have really low life expectancies? Did people even live long enough um, uh, throughout the human past to survive to a point where they would get heart disease? You know, even in Roman times, the average age of death was in the mid-30s. Um, Hunter-gatherer life expectancy at birth has always been around about 30 years. So could people have even live long enough to develop cardiovascular disease? So there's this idea that life was nasty, brutish, and short in the past. And a lot of that comes from the way that we measure life expectancy. So oftentimes, demographers uh, and sociologists will use a measure called life expectancy at birth. But one of the things is, that doesn't really tell you how long people live. What it tells you is the age at which people die. So to measure life expectancy at birth, you add up everybody's age at death and then divide by the number of people. Seems pretty straightforward. And it works great in these Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic nations where we have really low infant mortality. But if you have a population with relatively high infant mortality, it gives an artificially low life expectancy. So let's look at an example. So think about Japan. Japan has the highest life expectancy at birth of any population on the planet. And so if you were to um, just add up when people died, maybe some people are dying at 74, 80, 82, 87, 92, divide that by the people in the, in the sample, and you get 83. And that's the life expectancy right now in Japan. 
Well, if you look at a hypothetical um, hunter-gatherer population that has really high infant mortality, then maybe they're living just as long. Maybe they're dying at age 74 or age 82 or age 92 if they live past infancy. But oftentimes, hunter-gatherers had really high infant mortality, meaning that um, a lot of infants and babies didn't survive. So when you take a population like this, even though those that reach adulthood are all um, dying at quite late ages, um, when you calculate their life expectancy at birth, because of the infant mortality, they end up with this artificially low life expectancy. Uh, so in this example, people were living just as long in terms of uh, the oldest ages, uh, but one population had high infant mortality, the other had low infant mortality. And this led to a really big differential in life expectancy. OK, so if life expectancy at birth isn't a great um, measure of how long people actually live, what is? Well, a commonly used measure is the modal age at death. So modal age at death is just the most common age at which people die. And so if you look at people who make it to adulthood in, um, in living populations of hunter-gatherers and forager horticulturalists, these subsistence populations that don't live in cities, um, what they find, what researchers find, is that the average person lives to their 60s and 70s. Most people in these populations die between age 68 and 78. So throughout most of human history, people really were uh, living to their 60s and 70s. So if people did live these long lives uh, throughout most of the human past, did they get these chronic diseases of aging, like uh, heart disease, like we get today? Has heart disease always been a major cause of death? Or is there something weird about the way in which we live today that causes cardiovascular disease? Well, this has been a topic that many people have talked about for quite some time. You know, we have these, um, uh, these bodies uh, that evolved through millions of years of living as hunter-gatherers, and now suddenly we're in these bizarre new environments, these uh, urban jungles. One of the problems, though, is that it can be quite difficult to study these small-scale populations because oftentimes uh, there are only a few hundred individuals left, or they're living in a very marginalized environment. I'm lucky to work with the Chimane. They're a group of forager horticulturalists in the Bolivian Amazon. They practice a traditional lifestyle of uh, hunting, fishing, and small-scale slash-and-burn horticulture. They get about two-thirds of their calories from farming, about 17% from hunting, about 7% from fishing, and then uh, they get a few calories from market goods. But they uh, live a, a almost entirely um, off-the-grid uh, lifestyle. Uh, no Chimane communities have running water, and until very recently, no Chimane communities had electricity. Uh, most of the Chimane population of about 16,000 individuals is spread across about 95 communities, averaging between, three, between 30 and 500 people. The average woman in this population has about 9.1 children. Uh, the modal age at death for those who reach age, age 15 is 70, so they certainly are living long enough to develop something like cardiovascular disease. There's a wide level of variation, relatively low levels of acculturation, market integration, Spanish-speaking ability. The Chimane speak their own language isolate that keeps them relatively isolated from uh, Bolivia as a whole. And they also have essentially no access to medical care. Uh, men in this population average about 4.5 hours of physical activity per day, burning about 850 more calories than men in industrialized populations. You see, it can be um, uh, really quite tough to, um, uh, to live a subsistence lifestyle. Um, the average Shimane hunt, like I said, lasts about eight hours, covers more than 17 kilometers. If you want meat, you can't just go to the grocery store. You have to go out and get it yourself. Uh, going out and clearing large areas of the rainforest with a metal-headed ax uh, and then burning it to plant your crops is really quite difficult. And hunting is a really physically active way of life. Because of their lifestyle and diet, um, the Chimane have relatively low cardiovascular disease risk factors. So they have relatively low rates of things like obesity. In the US, about 40% of adults are obese. Only 6% of the Chimane are obese. In the US, we see about 34-35% of adults are hypertensive or have high blood pressure. Among the Chimane, it's less than 5% of the population. Uh, there are no Chimane. Uh, with very high total cholesterol, whereas 11% of people in the U.S. have high cholesterol. 
And in terms of the bad cholesterol or low density lipoprotein, uh, about 37% of people in the US have high bad cholesterol, whereas less than 10% of Shimane have high bad cholesterol. Around 10% of the US has uh, diabetes, whereas there are no, ch no Chimane with diabetes. Now, some of this is likely due to uh, dietary differences. So about 50% of calories that people eat in the US um, uh, come from carbohydrates, whereas about 72% uh, of the diet comes from carbohydrates among the Chimane. Um, both populations get about 16% of their calories from uh, protein. But in the US, uh, we have higher uh, levels of fat in our diet and much higher levels of saturated fat. Chimane don't really have things like uh, sugar, salt, no trans fats or preservatives in their diet. When it comes to physical activity, this is where you see some really major differences across the population. So in the US, people average around a little over 5,000 steps per day. You know, people walk to their car, walk from the car to the office, walk from the office back to the car, um, drive to the grocery store, drive back home. Really not that much physical activity required in industrialized populations. Chimane, on the other hand, average about 16,600 steps per day. It's almost 17,000 steps per day, about three times what people in the US get. So in terms of the what we call modifiable risk factors, so lifestyle uh, risk factors of cardiovascular disease, Chimane have great, great cholesterol, uh, excellent diet, and very high levels of physical activity. So what about something like cardiovascular disease? Well, while it's easy to measure something like blood pressure, it's really difficult to measure true cardiovascular disease. Most people in the US don't realize they have cardiovascular disease until they have a heart attack. And so you can imagine that um, in the middle of the Bolivian Amazon, it's going to be pretty difficult to tell if someone has cardiovascular disease. Luckily, there have been some major improvements in terms of the technology available to measure cardiovascular disease. And one of those is cardiac imaging. So you can actually measure the density of calcification in the coronary arteries. And this is going to be the true gold standard measure of cardiovascular disease. If you have actual um, plaques that are forming inside of your arteries, then you're really at risk of a heart attack and you have cardiovascular disease. And uh, coronary artery calcification measurements are great because they're non-invasive and you can measure them in uh, the arteries of living people. So the research group that I work with, the Chimane Health and Life History Project, we brought around a little over 700 Chimane from uh, remote uh, jungle communities uh, to the nearby regional capital uh, where there's a, 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 a CT machine. And we took images of coronary artery calcium uh, after people got medical care in the hospital. And what did we find? Well, compared to people, if you look at people in the US, um, uh, uh, you see increases in coronary artery calcium with age. And in fact, uh, the average um, uh, US white male has pretty significant coronary artery calcium by the time he hits age 75. This is not the case for the Chimane. Chimane have very, very low levels of coronary artery calcium and very little increase with age. Similarly, Chimane women have very low levels of coronary artery calcium compared to US women. In fact, about 85% of Chimane had no coronary, coronary artery calcium whatsoever, so no evidence of cardiovascular disease. Only about 14% in the U uh, percent of people in the US do not have coronary artery calcification. So while 86% of people in the US have coronary artery uh, calcification, only 15% of Chimane do. Additionally, um, having a little bit of coronary artery calcium uh, isn't so terrible, but having very high levels can be quite dangerous. Only 2.8% of Chimane had relatively high levels of coronary artery calcification that could potentially become uh, dangerous or result in heart disease, whereas 50% of people in the US have high coronary artery calcium. And it's not just compared to the US that um, the uh, Chimane have actually uh, quite healthy hearts. Uh, if you look at men worldwide from Asia, um, Europe, and the US, Chimane have the lowest levels of coronary artery calcium ever seen. Similarly, uh, Chimane women have the lowest levels of coronary artery calcium ever seen.
So to summarize, Chimane have some of the healthiest hearts ever measured. We see really low rates of cardiovascular risk factors, things like smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, or high cholesterol. Chimane have very high levels of physical activity and really minimal sedentism. They aren't sitting in an office chair all day. Um, so based on uh, these measures of uh, um, arterial calcium and, uh, and different biomarkers, uh, Chimane have arteries that are about 28 years younger than individuals living in industrialized populations. One of the things to keep in mind here is that human evolution occurred in a mosaic of different environments. There's no single population that we can point to and say that's the perfect example of the human evolutionary past. But what we do know is that humans didn't evolve in cities. Cities are a really new, novel environment. And one of the problems is that almost all of the research that we conduct in terms of medical research and psychological research um, and just most of the research dollars in general go to studying people in these weird populations, these people living in cities. Um, and that really doesn't allow us to see the wide range of variation in human health uh, that exists worldwide. With a better understanding in just the total variation in human health and disease, we can better understand the causes and maybe some of the solutions to some of the key health problems facing the world today. And this is just one example of a relatively new research area called evolutionary medicine. We apply evolutionary biology and an understanding of the human evolutionary past to medical research to better understand uh, the current problems we face and come up with new solutions. Thank you.